Perpetual growth in a finite environment is tantamount to suicide. And ultimately that's, that's what we're doing. We're, we're slowly suffocating ourselves from ourselves. What has sustained us for you know, 300,000 years or so is no longer applicable. And I think that's really ultimately what people really wrestle with. That's what's very difficult because we, first of all, we rebel against that. And then we choose to deny it because we don't want to face those realities. And then if we face those realities, we tend to ignore them because they're inconvenient. And ultimately we continue to perpetuate the cycle that got us in the mess in the first place. But these environments, the, the polar regions specifically, still remain very foreign to most of us. They're practically like another planet. So my camera is essentially a tool to not only bring back experience and help people be connected with their world, but it's also an attempt at helping people fall in love with their world, with the idea that it'll be a lot easier to save something that you love that typically we don't save what we don't love. And so to bring back an environment that is in reality in our own backyard, it's, it's very accessible by virtue of our footprint. You know, what we do thousands of miles away is having an impact on these regions. But geographically, we're not, it still feels quite distant. And so there's a disconnect really there between the two. And science can only bridge that disconnect to a point because science can be abstract and complex and esoteric and difficult to, to grasp, whereas photography is emotional. If you see something that you, you relate to, and, uh, you know, and the case in point of that is the poster child of climate change. You put a polar bear uh, and with the cubs and you say that that animal is endangered, people respond to it. Of course, there are a lot more species endangered by it and there are a lot more ways to communicate by it, but at least this has an emotional connection to the viewer and it triggers a little response in the heart that hopefully can translate into the mind and, um, and ideally can translate into a program of action. You know, the image that is imprinted on my mind of a vast, untouched, opened an infinite canvas of white and blue, which is just the sky and the ice and sort of split across the horizon line. And the very simplicity of that, as well as the sense of serenity, the calm, the silence that it brings internally, the ability to hear my thoughts in a way that rarely happens except sometimes when it's just a dark room in the middle of the night and you wake up and, and you're not disturbed by a bombardment of information and uh, distractions. And so that is the most memorable aspect that I bring back from a number of different expeditions, not just one. It's the ability to actually settle into a place where it, you can be just yourself and you have time to really think through who you would like to be, how you'd like to see the world, how do you fit within the context of the natural uh, environment that you're in, and how wholesome and symbiotic that is to us. We've lost that connection and it's, it's something that urban life and, and the context of traffic and sounds and distractions of communications and emails and Facebooks and all of that stuff has really acted more as a disconnect rather than a, a connector. And it's the great irony of our time, of course, is that we, we have so many more tools to connect and in the end we feel more and more isolated. And I think that has a lot to do with the fact that we are just so distracted by so many externalities. By venturing into the wild, we, we get to be reconnected with 
the earth and by virtue of that we get reconnected to ourselves and uh, that is actually very empowering not only is it empowering but it also brings us great sense of peace and those are the most memorable experiences that I bring back from my expeditions. But ultimately what holds the greatest promise for our future is the new generation coming up, uh, the kids growing up today who are sophisticated in ways that my generation uh, could, not have, could only have dreamt of in terms of their understanding of, of sustainable issues. This is a generation who is growing up with electric cars and, uh, and hybrid vehicles, who understand the ideas of recycling, who recognize that there is an overreaching problem of an environment that is threatened by our imprint, our footprint as human societies. Um, this, once again, these are, these are complex and sophisticated principles which children growing up today grasp. And these are the voters of the future, and these are the architects of the future, and the inventors of the futures, and the, uh, the engineers, and the, uh, the politicians, and the business leaders of the future. So I think that we will see an exponential growth in, in a sustainable economy. Bearing in mind again that 10 years ago, things were not the way they are today in terms of our awareness level. Uh, in 10 years, a lot was accomplished, and you take 10 years from now, and you've got an entire generation of eco-conscious societies and voters and, um, and agents of change. And um, with any luck, they'll implement a, uh, an exponential speed of change that may save us all. My vision for the future encompasses a complete re-examination of our modes of existence. We obviously are not sustainable in the way that we live. The, the planet is too small for the way in which we behave. We consume too much, there are too many of us, and, um, and we live within a finite environment. Against that backdrop, we are exponentially growing in demographics. Our population is twice the numbers that it was when I was born. Uh, we live almost twice as long as we did 100 years ago. Uh, so effectively, we've doubled whatever that amount of people are, and we still exist within a limited environment. And our footprint is such that we're actually threatening the very ability of this planet to actually provide for us. So the trend is descending right now. It doesn't look good, but we've been able to mobilize in the past in ways that have been very inspirational. We have the intellectual acumen and the intellectual resources to really activate a program of change. The, the, the real issue and what's missing is a commitment to doing so. And, uh, and unfortunately, there's no silver bullet for that. It's, uh, it's something that will ultimately begin at the people level. People have to make that change. And uh, it won't be governments, because governments will only really do what the people want at the end of the day. They just want to be re-elected. And business leaders will sell what people ask for, and they'll stop selling what they don't want. So it really comes down to a personal accountability. And, um, and sadly, in a sense, that responsibility begins with every one of us.